It's time for this week's Prairie Cast. This week's Prairie Cast is brought to you by Delta Dental of Iowa, who reminds you that you don't have to work for a big company to get big benefits. Delta Dental offers a dental plan to fit your needs. Whether it is a single policy, one for your family, or one for the team at your startup, visit DeltaDentalIA.com to learn more about your many plan options. Hi there, and welcome to episode 70 of Prairie Cast for January 17th, 2012. I'm Jeff Wood of Silicon Prairie News. This is Andy Brudkel at 48 Web. We are your hosts. Our guests today are Emma Peterson of Tickley. You're back again for week two. Absolutely. Welcome. Sam Dreger of Douala. We haven't seen you in a while, so it's good to have yeah, you back. Since I was uh, Sam Dreger of Charming Beard, mm-hmm. yeah. so there's, we been, some, had you on? there's no. been some transition. Yeah. Okay, very good. We did talk about the change, though, with Jordan, I think, one time. Yep. <laughs> so welcome back in your new form, I guess, uh, regenerated <laughs> as a member of Douala. Uh, they're both in studio, and then online through Skype today, we have a guest from Omaha. It's one of our editors, Michael Stacy. Hi, Michael. How are you? Pretty good. How are you guys? Awesome. We're doing well. It's been a while since we've had you on the show. Do you have any surprises planned for us today? Uh, I, I'm a little disappointed in myself. I do not uh, have any. The prop department kind of failed me today, so <laughs> we'll have to uh, consult with them and, and get something for next time I'm on. All right. Uh, for those of you that remember the last time Michael was on, Back in the days when I wore a sport coat on the show, until Michael was on, I think, and he, he showed up with a Don Johnson sport coat to, to, be, to be me. Um, uh, yeah, let's, let's get into the... Oh, one thing before we do get started. Um, Tickley, have you signed up the Angler Theater yet in Iowa City? <laughs> uh, no, not yet, but we're on it. Okay. I'm so sorry, Jeff. That's, no, I try to utilize the startups in town and wanted to go to a show in April in Iowa City, and I was surprised at the... Fifteen dollars in taxes and fees that were <laughs> tacked on to my. Uh, yeah, payments. I ran the math on that. Did you see my response? I did. I did. I don't remember what it I think was, it was like exactly, seven or something but like yeah, that. we would have saved you. Yeah. Quite a bit of money. I would have liked that. More so, than one drink. For more, sure. than, more than one drink. So Angler Theater in <clears throat> Iowa City sure, sure need to be on Tickley for the future, and and I would have. I guess bought more tickets, maybe. I don't know. But you might have. I might have. I, I was surprised. <laughs> but speaking of shows, Jake Kerber sent me a text today, and he is looking for interns and volunteers who want to work on shows and with software and with bands. Um, I don't know. You guys probably have a pretty decent overlap in your two companies, I would think, as far as clients and. Yeah, you know, it makes a lot of sense that uh, Jake and I work together. Not only, well, I guess I don't live in Ankeny anymore, but we used to live in Ankeny, yeah. um, and so does Dylan from Shareware. So we call it like the startup triangle. Nice. Um, Northeast Ankeny. Anyhow, he um, is a good friend of Tickley's, and we have a lot of synergy there. But at the end of the day, obviously different goals. Um, sure. But, yeah, no, I I could probably find interns for Jake. Well, he's I'll looking be in touch. Interns and volunteers, um, I don't know if they're, like, street teams or what, but really, like, reaching out to bands and things like that. I know that he's trying to ramp up quickly. So cool. if you were interested in that, hit him up at jake at com. That's L-O-C-U-S-I-C dot com. All right, let's uh, get started on the show today. Um, first thing, story I want to talk about, two big events were announced in the last week right here in Iowa. One is the Iowa Startup Fair coming up on January 31st, and the second is an event called I2 Iowa on April 12th. Uh, let's go ahead and start with the Startup Fair. It's an event being organized by Christian Raynaud and Becky Mullenkamp on behalf of Startup Iowa, uh, which, as you probably know, is the Startup America Regional Initiative that takes place in this state. Um, we've talked about a lot on the show. We had Scott Case kind of on, on the launch day um, not too long ago. But um, the Startup Fair is a kind of a statewide celebration of all things startup um, taking place in the form of kind of a trade show, not real formal booth type thing, but come and see the startups, that type of thing. Are you guys going to participate with your startups? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, of course. I mean, it's it's a really exciting moment for everybody because I think that things like what you did with organizing the startup job crawl and now the startup fair, it's putting a really good light on what we're up to and, um, you know, kind of keeps that momentum going. I know we asked Scott Case when he was here, like, what does Startup Iowa do? What does Startup America do? Well, this is a good exercise of at least where our heads are at with being partners in this, so... Yeah, I think there are 40-some maybe organizations signed up. I think I saw a number like that. Did you say you had seen it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got a list. I got a list. There are quite a few signed up for the Des Moines um, Startup Fair here. And then there are one, two, three, four, five, six in Pella. 
and about four signed up in Cedar Rapids. So I would say Des Moines, we're looking at probably 30. 30 um, mm -hmm. Right now, if I was doing an eyeball count. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. And, and um, it, as you said, it's statewide, so in multiple locations. I want to say Cedar Falls is planning something as well. I don't know you have contacts up there. Have you heard anything? Yeah, I actually, I believe I have heard that Cedar Falls will be on. I don't know much about it, but I've heard a rumor that at the Pella one, Peace mm -hmm. Tree Brewing Company is going to be doing samples or something. Is oh, this that's true? fantastic. I have not heard. I, I, got a, I got an email out to kind of get more information on the Pella. Um, unfortunately, with my connection with Douala, I will yep. be in Des Moines yes. for the Startup Fair and not in the Pelican Valley. But yep. um, looking forward to seeing what they do down there and hearing some news, see if there's any new um, startups that kind of come to that maybe as an idea um, and, and then get spurred on because there is an environment for growth down there. Yeah, that's um, uh, yeah. It should be interesting. So as you said, kind of talking about the startup job crawl. Same three buildings: the Silicon yes. Sixth kind of community, Midland, Bank of America, where you guys mm -hmm. are, and then um, Liberty up the street. Uh, I don't know if there's any planned like shifting like we did with that. Like, okay, everybody move to the next building, or if it's just kind of milling about through all of them for that day. But I think it's three to six. Does that sound right? Um, mm -hmm. So right after Prairiecast on the thirty first, um, you could come uh, enjoy that, uh, take part. Lots of different people, lots of startups, lots of kind of quasi startups that I saw and like incubators and government initiative type, just like the whole kind of startup community showcasing. And um, here in this building, we'll be down at Ibichi, um in the side room. I think there's just going to be about 10 different companies down there. So should be a lot of fun. Uh, Michael, any thoughts on startup job fair? Uh, I guess first and foremost strikes me as a good opportunity for another live Prairie cast. I know you've had a, a studio audience before Ooh. and uh, maybe this would be a good way to, to get that. Uh, you mentioned Cedar Falls, and I did hear that Far Reach Technologies is, is supposedly going to be the host of uh, some sort of fair activity up there. Uh, and then there was also talk of maybe something out in West Des Moines as well. I don't know if you've heard any more about that, but I think there are still other uh, locations in the works at the moment. Uh, yeah, it looks like Becky's in the chat room. She said that Far Reach is hosting for Cedar Falls, so that's true. Um, I saw the West Des Moines incubator was on the list, I think, participating um, in Des Moines, so I would imagine it's probably just one um, in Des Moines at this point. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, look, Becky is confirming that online. This is real-time data here. <laughs> and then Thank you, Becky. Uh, we would have mentioned, I should have mentioned this, but in Pella, uh, Central College is, ho is uh, hosting that. And Wade Steinhook is the um, uh, entrepreneurship program director. He's kind of the head of that. And Joel Bennett of Vielhoden are down there coordinating. Uh, and it looks like they're going to be pulling from not only Pella, but again, Knoxville with Peachtree, uh, Oskaloosa, Newton, and Grinnell, and trying to get more of that Marion County um, entrepreneurship hub people there. Um, so that's interesting, kind of see um, if students show up, because we're always looking at the job crawl or, yeah, the startup crawl. I'm um, getting student up, students uh, really active in that community, so I'm excited to see what happens down there at Central. Yeah, I am. I am as well. And, and one other, well, I think we have this sufficiently covered. But just one other one that that I do want to mention. Um, I know the Des Moines Downtown Chamber has been looking to do this. They kind of started talk, asking at the startup job crawl, like how do we get the chamber members who aren't startups to know about the startups and to see what services there are. And I think they've kind of joined forces on this of let's get the chamber members to come out to the startup job fair to, to kind of meet those people in a good way to do that. Um, so uh, yeah, I think this is really exciting. More so than anything, I'm excited to see that this is something tangible kind mm -hmm. of coming out of startup Iowa. And that's always been kind of the question of what Absolutely. does that mean? You know, like now we have this, what do we do with it? And mm -hmm. and coordination of types of things like this is, is apparently what we do with it. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to see where that happens. Yeah, and to to Iowa's credit, they uh, you know jumped aboard the the Startup America partnership earlier than any of the other states in the region uh, with their December launch. Uh, several other states in the region will be launching on the thirty first: uh, Missouri, Kansas, and Nebraska among them. So it'll be a busy day across the entire Silicon Prairie, and Iowa's kind of uh, leading that that effort. Yeah, great point. So the other kind of three states that we regularly report on are jumping in um, that day. And I think there are more states even outside of that that, that are joining the Startup America Partnership uh, as regional initiatives that day. So cool. it is it is a literal startup day in America. <laughs> uh, so looking forward to that. Update kind of tangentially related, Scott Case Challenge from Think Iowa. Scott is the head of the Startup America Partnership, talked, um, gave a great presentation and discussion um, at think Iowa and he put out kind of threw out the gauntlet and said California has the most startups registered with Startup America we want to see the Silicon Prairie exceed California and um, that challenge has grown to just be the Silicon Prairie to now be like 
pit every state against everybody, and you can see a live leaderboard on SARPAmericaPartnership.org or whatever the website is. Mm -hmm. um, we are not winning this challenge. <laughs> uh, we are uh, severely behind California and um, yeah, probably not going to win it ever. So, uh, but that's all right. It's still good to, to see kind of where we rank in there. And, and right now, California has 439 startups registered. Uh, combined in the Silicon Prairie is 99. Uh, Iowa is leading that with 39. Missouri with next to 34. Kansas has 15. Nebraska has 11, which is a huge upgrade over, I think, four the last time yeah. we talked about this. <clears throat> but, but still surprising that there's not more Nebraska startups that have registered. And, and one of those does include Silicon Prairie News because after like talking about it twice on the show and saying, we've never registered, I went ahead and did that. And, and we are on the <laughs> Nebraska list. Good. Are you guys are staff ninja? Yes, we are on it. You're one yep. of them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? Uh, All right. While Scott Case was on the stage, I was signing up. Oh, you signed it right yeah. there during Think I. Oh, yeah. Okay. I take so. challenges very seriously. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> we need someone to lead the charge on this challenge because we are far, far behind. We are fourth, less than a fourth of what's of what's going on in California. All right. Well, I'll see if I can come up with something. Okay. This is now on your shoulders, and I will not talk about <laughs> it again. Uh, no, very good. Uh, Michael, any thoughts on the challenge? You're kind of a leaderboard guy. Yeah, uh, I, I suppose, uh, I, I, once again, I was kind of the leader, and maybe it's just a matter of time, and, and with the launch of Startup Iowa, you kind of see the trickle-down effect of, you know, Iowa leading at least the region, so maybe these other states with that January 31st launch will see a spike in, uh, in startups registering for that case challenge. That's at least the hope as kind of a, a Silicon Prairie homer, I guess. <laughs> Yes, uh, it'd be great to see more people on there um, and, and see what, uh, yeah, just to see kind of where that goes. But uh, exciting uh, for Startup Day coming up, January 31st. So that's a Tuesday in what, two weeks? Come, yeah, very, hey. Today's Tuesday? Where are Today's we? Today's Tuesday, <laughs> very soon. All right, the other event, the I2 Iowa, um, I guess, Innov Investors and Innovators Forum is announced coming up April 12th statewide event here put on by the Technology Association of Iowa and sponsored by the Iowa Economic Development Authority. Um, this is a, an interesting event because as we were kind of chatting before the show, it, it feels, it's definitely a new event, but it feels like an event we used to have called the Iowa Entrepreneurs Conference Adventure Forum that mm -hmm. kind of, kind of Fizzled. unceremoniously fizzled last <laughs> year. Um, and this looks like it's a replacement. What do you guys think well, about I, this event? Well, my question to that is, is from somebody who's done an event that's similar, what did you guys find were some of the drawbacks? Were there just not enough traction, not enough companies ready to pitch? I know they've opened the door to life and biosciences, advanced mm -hmm. manufacturing, and general business. So that covers a lot of bases plus information technology, right? Yeah. So do you think having a broader focus, so bringing the manufacturers who want to pitch because they have something they want to build, uh, does that help people come to the door? It, yes, I, I, I would think <laughs> a so. A tentative yes from well, Jeff. I would love to say that was strategically chosen, like those three, because there's going to be the most activity. But mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure those three were chosen because those are the state's targeted industries, and like mm -hmm. IDEA or IDEA, like that's what they fund because the sure. legislature like chose those ten years ago as like the target industries for Iowa. And then there's a fourth category of general business. Um, so I, don't, I guess I don't have a good answer for you, but. Um, I think what's different than last time, though, is this is no longer the state putting this on. It's mm -hmm. that private association, like the membership group TAI, putting it on. The sure. state is just sponsoring it, whereas before it was very much the state's conference right. in conjunction right. with the Iowa Fund of Funds conference, which is the Venture Forum. So it's it's hitting a lot of the same points that the event before was hitting, but put on by a different group. So we'll okay. see. Okay. So they, had, they have a user list that they are plugging into as opposed to a state-run um, conference or event. That's interesting. It's an interesting concept. I think um, I know what, there's a lot of places that have done it before, but to get a place where you can actually pitch your product or your business in front of people that might give you money, I mean, for anything, that's at least practice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to do a pitch for these small businesses. It is, and I think it's the idea is to kind of like pitch and grow, but like the next step, or I'm, I'm sorry, probably more like, have you guys been... These guys are both working out of Startup City, so I'm referencing Startup City here. But like the Money Day event, were either oh, of you yeah. involved in that? I wasn't there no. yet. <laughs> you there yet? No. I was you know, signing on clients that day. So. Oh, out working. <laughs> yeah, I, I was out working that day. Well, but I think the idea behind Money Day is like, let's put real investors ready to put their money into <laughs> yeah. companies with right. real companies ready to take that and not so much just a practice thing. And I think mm -hmm. that's what I2IO is supposed to be for more industries on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. Sure. So is it actually pitching or, I mean, like, I, I'm still confused on the format of it. Is it more of like 
the startup fair where you sit around and talk to other people, or how, how's it going to work? So right. what I think, I, I have no idea for sure. I'm not involved with planning this at all. But um, what I understand is that we are definitely going, if you enroll in this, you definitely have to pitch your company because um, you pick one of these tracks and everything and go through that experience. But then what I'm confused about is whether or not there's also this startup fair alongside. Mm. So you go t through the tracks and everything, but maybe we each have a representation at you know, a booth or something because that's what I'm seeing here is that you're supposed to be showcasing your company Right, and they say that they are going to pick um, people to present. So there mm -hmm. is going to be some curation of who's actually pitching and presenting to the investors. And that's going to be, um, you're well, going to have to fill out, yeah, ready, fill up yeah. the application, and they're going to go through the applications and decide who is worthy enough to pitch. Which is really, really or interesting. Or who's the top <laughs> candidates. Yeah, right, yeah. correct. But yeah. But it's kind of interesting because what they say here is that um, they're wanting to get money ready. Uh, businesses in front of these investors, but every mentor that I've ever spoke to about raising money always says start the conversation before you're in the point where you need the money. So I think that's awesome. Great. We should definitely put those key players in front of each other, but I wonder if that's kind of turning the exercise of dating and creating a really good relationship amongst startups and their potential investors into kind of a speed dating, blind dating, blind Dating, yeah. yeah, experience. The speed dating would be like that. Would probably be a great. It's kind of like this right? is who I am. Want to give me money? Right. Yes. Exactly. Great. Let's exactly. go. <laughs> um, that that's a little. I think it's scary from different. an investor standpoint if I'm yeah. giving money, but it also is maybe a little bit tentative for the uh, person pitching. Um, does this mean if they say yes, do I have to take their money? Yeah. Um, or what is the ongoing relationship that's happening after this conference? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I love the idea. I oh, think totally. getting people in the room together talking is fantastic, but let's not make it a speed dating uh, where you're just going to table to table to present and see if there's a good match or not. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it's, 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 go ahead. That's it. And I don't know the answer to any of this, although I should say I have been in some of the planning meetings for this, but more general, like, committee meetings where they've been talking about this event going on. I don't know the specifics of the event itself, but um, I, I think that the danger is that this becomes what the last conference was. Like, you embark on this idea of doing something completely different, but the same rule, like, the same vo goals are in place, so it becomes the same event a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. But the way that that happened before is kind of the Shark Tank idea where, um, you know, investors and interested parties sitting at tables all around the room, somebody gets up on stage. Um, and they give their pitch, and then, okay, now all these investors are aware of this company, and this idea is out there, they can follow up privately and do the dating mm -hmm. thing and see if they want to be involved mm -hmm. or not. Well, is that what Pitch and Grow is then? Yeah, it is what Pitch and Grow is, but I think that Pitch and Grow is intended to be practice. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and Pitch and Grow is investors who just happen to want to be there go, whereas I think this, they're trying to get investors lined up. They're working up. both sides, yeah, yeah. exactly. And yeah. isn't it part of the whole... Um, like Prometheus Awards, is yeah, it that same day? Same yeah, and I, th I think that was part of the idea was we Prometheus Awards are the Technology Association's like annual awards gala yes. type of thing. So we're already having venture capitalists that come to Prometheus Awards. Mm -hmm. We're already having these companies come here because they're up for the awards. Let's do piggyback these things. So I think one's Thursday, the next is Friday. Like you're already in town for that type of thing. What were you going to say, Michael? I think the important distinction between the I to Iowa and the, the Pitch and Grow is that the I to Iowa is the investment ready companies, whereas Pitch and Grow is always phrased as kind of a, a supportive and and uh, you know helpful network of potential investors, but not you know investment ready. Uh, so you know Pitch and Grow is very much kind of the, the proving ground, whereas I to Iowa I think is is hopefully making those connections. But as you all have mentioned, it, it'll be interesting to see kind of the uh, the relationships that are formed and whether or not it's an immediate thing or something that's kind of prolonged and this just serves as that, that connection, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think that's the case. If, if you do want to pitch at I2I when you are that investment-ready company, um, mm -hmm. you need to apply by February 7th, so you know three or four weeks away. Um, it looks like it's an AngelSoft or whatever AngelSoft is called now, so it's a very formal, like, fill out all this information to be able to um, I know it's a different name, I don't remember what it is, but like to be able to actually yeah. pitch and you go through, so you're kind of vetted before you get there, that type of thing. Um, I'm not a big fan of those programs, but but it's out there. Same same program if you're going to apply for like the Papa John business plan competition. I think they use AngelSoft as well. Um, uh, like I said, it is the day after the Prometheus Award, so nominations are still open for Prometheus if that is um, of interest for your company. I think there's like 15 different categories. Um, Dwala, I think, was startup of the year last year. 
um, winter, or maybe that was two years ago. Uh, I'm trying to think if anybody else off the top of my head. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> no, Prometheus is still fun. in college. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so check that out. But anyway, those are due um, the 24th is the deadline for that. So that is coming up very, very quickly, 24th of this month. All right. Cool. Anything else on these big events I here in this state? A lot going on. A lot yeah. going on. They're going to yeah. be fun. I don't really know what to expect, which is normal, right? Because these are <laughs> the inaugural year for both, but I'm sure it's a, a yeah. great way to keep everything moving forward in the startup community. So Startup Job Fair, 31st, I2 Iowa, April 12th. Um, yeah. All right. So huge thanks to Procast sponsor, Delta Dental of Iowa. Um, they have allowed us to kind of improve this show, and there's there's an in-studio improvement that you can't see right now, but for those of us watching Michael, we have a lot better screen to do it on, and that's all mm -hmm. thanks to Delta Dental of Iowa. When it comes to taking care of your smile, rely on a company that you can trust, and the fact is that more Iowans trust their smiles to Delta Dental. Whether you're looking for a dental policy for yourself, your family, or your startup, visit deltadentalia.com to learn more about your many plan options. Thanks again, Delta Dental. All right. Um, been talking about Iowa a lot, but since we have Michael on today, let's talk about uh, one of Omaha's big startups, and that is Bloom.com, who announced a milestone this week. Uh, they expect to be at 100,000 members yet this month, and that's just six months after launching. Um, uh, that national launch was in August. They had 20,000 members, I assume, that came out of their beta program at that point, and, and now they're five times that. Pretty exciting for those guys. It's pretty good growth for six months. Mm -hmm. Michael, what do you know, kind of, what's the, the local scuttlebutt about Bloom and what they're building in Omaha? Uh, well, I think, obviously, the, the one big thing is the, the founders there have a lot of credibility in e-commerce with their background uh, as Hay Needle co-founders uh, between uh, Nielsen and Malik, uh, two of the three Hay Needle founders, and their reputation kind of precedes them, and then with their numbers in the first few months, they're certainly living up to that reputation. Uh, and what's also striking about their growth is uh, Nick Hudson, who is their chief marketing officer, said that their marketing approach has not been all that aggressive, that they're kind of relying on grassroots type stuff. Uh, so that growth seems to be fairly organic. And uh, there's, you know, there's no telling what, what is possible once they kind of ramp up the marketing efforts a little more. Yeah, that's a good point. And I didn't even really pick that up from the story. But um yeah, these guys, so the company behind Bloom, I guess we should say, is exuba.com. That's X-U-B-A dot com. Um, and as Michael said, two of the three founders from Hay Needle, which is a um, online stores company uh, that you probably have never heard of. I know they've had trouble kind of branding themselves. It used to be called Net Shops. Started with hammocks.com, and now they have hundreds, if not more, different stores. I bought a couch for our house from... Hey Needle and simplymirrors.com got a mirror, that type of thing. So whenever you're searching for random objects on the internet and you find a very site-specific store, if you look down at the bottom, it'll probably say heyneedle.com is, is who's serving it. Um, but yeah, so they have exited that and, and are now uh, working on this new company, Exuba. Bloom.com is the first property that they launched and uh, yeah, it's, it's growing fast. Sorry, I should have done the background at the top of the story. But yeah, we're working on this. If you want more background on the Hay Needle story, uh, we've we've covered before. For instance, Mark Haysbrook, who was co-founder of, of uh, Hay Needle with Julie Malik and Doug Nielsen, uh, and provided a little bit of that backstory. But uh, that company's growth was just astounding, and and to see those two uh, now leading a new company, I think that's you know I think why Danny named this company one of the ten to watch in 2012 on Silicon Prairie, and and why there is so much buzz around it. Uh, so yeah, if, if you're not familiar with those founders, it's worth looking into their story and, and I think you'll understand a little bit more of why we're so interested to see what we can do. Yeah, and, and we've talked about that before, I think, when these guys launched. Hazebrook is putting his time and energy and money back into the ecosystem in Omaha with Dundee Venture Capital. Now these two are doing it with, with Exuba and, and Bloom. And um, Bloom is a, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's it's... It's a shop for getting recommended beauty products mm -hmm. based on... Yeah, and I think that's yeah. the key, the yeah. recommended beauty products. Yeah. So we're talking about social um, networks combined with a social or an e-commerce website. And so you, you're relying on recommendations of your friends to say which product is the best product. And I think ongoing over the next 10 years, I feel like that's, that's what's going to happen. Utilizing Facebook is, is a great example of saying, well, I want to know what the best place to buy X is. Ask your face, uh, Facebook network, and they're going to answer you. And Bloom is kind of jumping on board with that. And I think that's genius. It's a great way to use uh, e-commerce. 
What I love yeah. about Zuba, though, is that they're using the same formula that was successful for Hay Needle. Though. They built this underlying technology, and then they're going to build different brands on top of that technology. So they're going to hit all these mm -hmm. different verticals, obviously starting with beauty products. Sure. So they're going to use the same social recommendation engine for who knows, hammocks probably in five years. And, and with great SEO, right? right? That, that was right. characteristic of Hay Needle um, all along, and now they're, they're applying that as well. Uh, Danny's telling me in the chat room that they consider themselves a social beauty store is the category mm -hmm. that they've picked for themselves. There you go. And when talking about Hay Needle, he said they had 250 different stores. So when I said hundreds, if not thousands, what I meant to say was 250. Uh, always good to have the extra input from the chat room. Absolutely. <laughs> Emma, uh, when we first talked about these guys launching, I think Zach Cox from Ponger was mm -hmm. on the show. It was four guys talking about it. And at the time, <laughs> it was only available to women. So none of us had actually tried it. But Zach, preparing like he does, had had his wife try it so he could at least give us some insight. You tried to sign up today, or you did yes, sign up today. I did like, some what investigative was your, reporting. What was your experience <laughs> like? Um, it's very interesting. I filled out my own profile and said, like, this is what I like about makeup and all this other stuff, right? It's very girly. Um, <laughs> and it's very interesting, but I guess the one hang-up I have right now, and I might just be missing it right now, is that when I click on my friends within the profile, it doesn't automatically tell me if any of my Facebook friends are on here. Hmm. So I figured that would be part of the sign-up process. Well, so it says, you know, I've, I logged in with Facebook, right? <laughs> You come down to my friends, so it automatically pulled all my information, but it just tells me social beauty is better with friends. Um, invite your friends. Maybe none of my friends are on there, and that's if, what's yeah. going on, but I'm just wondering if... Are you on the My Friends tab right there? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'm guessing you probably don't have any friends registered yet, because mm -hmm. it would probably be like my exam like Spotify, right, where it says, like, these are your I friends, and these are your friends so. on Spotify. I would certainly hope so, right. um, but like I said, I haven't seen that yet, so if, like, Becky Mullenkamp wants to log on, she should, <laughs> she should. <laughs> totally sign up for Bloom and let us know, because that's one thing that I'm thinking, you know, I, I don't like the idea that um, you go to bloom.com, and then you have to create a whole new social network. It allows you to message your friends through Facebook. And invite them, but I would hope that it would just auto complete that. And like I said, maybe it does. Yeah, maybe you should sign up right now, Andy. No, well, Andy here's here's something. Is there a bigger conversation to be had here about um, online shopping, online e-commerce, especially taking Bloom a beauty product? I know when my wife goes to try something, she wants to see what it looks like. She wants to test it out, mm -hmm. um, especially when we're talking about um, the eye creams and all that kind of stuff, mascara. I mean, does that change with Bloom? Do you basically rely on the recommendation of your friend uh, to say it's a good product and it works? Is that kind of, is that what they're trying to overcome that obstacle it's by saying like recommendation? How can they take Amazon's recommendation system and use social data to provide those recommendations? But makeup sure. is a really good place to start because honestly, when as somebody who wears makeup, when I go to the store mm -hmm. with a friend and I go to find like mascara or something, I, there are so many different types that usually I say, hey, what kind have you been using lately? Okay. Let's try that one. Or, you know, what would you recommend? It's constantly a recommendation thing because makeup, of all things, is something you want to be able to test out sure. before you make the $10 investment to start wearing it all the time, right? Um, Interesting. And then, yeah, and then they have the, the rewards built in, too. So if you, if you were recommending stuff to your friends from their sites, you get coupons and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So nice. that's kind of more of the social shopping experience of incentivizing <coughs> recommendations. Mm -hmm. It's $25 when they make a purchase. So it's definitely rewards focused. And so I, the, yeah, I, well, I think this is a, makeup specifically is a better place than like, to compare to like Spotify is what what I would use. But mm -hmm. like, I found that I don't necessarily agree with what any of my friends listen to. So that like social piece of music doesn't help me. Mm -hmm. But I would think in something like, like this is an, an area in, Non online, like real life, that, that you do go to your friends for recommendations. Yeah, absolutely. So but if you know, one of your friends recommends something and you don't necessarily like her choices or what she wears in makeup, you're like, oh no, I'll avoid not that. that product. Yeah. No, absolutely. You'd be like, <laughs> so you can use either not way. Like your face. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and you can go ahead and explore other people's beauty cabinets. So let's say that I have no friends on here, as I currently do. You can go ahead and look at all these other women who have their photos uploaded, and maybe one of them is you know, exactly who I want to look like. So, I don't know. I, I think it is very, very cool. I just do wonder, and hopefully I'll be able to figure this out by the next time 
we, we talk bloom, um, whether or not they're creating a barrier here. Because uh, I think that's one of the most dangerous things one can do is to create another social network where you have to make more circles. I mean, I'm using mm -hmm. path right now, and I like it. I do. I think it's cool. But I'm also like, should I post to Facebook and to Twitter and then to path mm -hmm. or just path and then have it post? And it's just this whole new world where you can't ask people to sign up for another thing and become yeah. members in a whole another thing when they already have those connections elsewhere. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Totally agree. And I think everybody's uh, having that problem with path. A couple notes on that. First and foremost, uh, if you're looking, Emma, for, uh, for friends on Bloom, Danny, for the sake of the story, actually registered an account for himself so you could, uh, okay. you could pay attention to his recommendations. Uh, <laughs> for eyeliner. Also, in, in the story, uh, Nick Hudson mentioned that kind of transparency and ease of, ease of use is, is something that they're focusing on going forward and that uh, there will be changes that apparently it'll, it'll take a little bit less effort to track down fellow users and, and you know, just navigate the site. So, as you mentioned, there might be less of, uh, you know, less of an obstacle to that in the future. And I think that's a focus of theirs going forward. Well, yeah, that's a great point. And and don't let that drop. That Danny Schreiber managing <laughs> of Silicon Prairie News is official <laughs> place that he buys makeup. Is <laughs> uh, no, that's good. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that works. So you're probably not friends with Danny. I don't on think Facebook. I'm friends with Danny on Facebook. Wow. So. There you go. Friend request sent. I was going to make a joke wow, about Danny. it. Your, your lack of Facebook <laughs> friends, that, that is why you well, have no friends. Well, Danny just hasn't approved me yet. <laughs> yeah. Danny. It's awkward. Let's get on that. <laughs> oh. He does have that Bloom account. So. But he does have a Bloom account. <laughs> uh, just one other note on, on Bloom that I want to share. Like, this came out of the story, but Nick shared that their current rate of selling, that if they continue to sell at that rate, that'll be $3.5 million in products sold um, in the next 12 months. And of course, they in yeah, intend incredible. for that rate to go up. But mm -hmm. Right. That's and then a, they want to spread that across multiple sites, too. So Yeah. I, this is different. one to keep an eye on. They're, yeah. they're doing a lot of uh, interesting things. And the, just what they've done with Hay Needle, I think, in, in the past and, and the exit there. And I'm excited to see where they go. So. We're often talking about the other startups, like who are the strong contenders, and, and that's why Danny put that list together of 10 to watch, as Michael said, and these guys are certainly on that. All right. Cool. Um, and th <laughs> uh, Danny is coming up with excuses for why he's not friends with Emma in the chat room. But, um, <laughs> anything really else? good friend. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts on Bloom before we move on? Uh, are they taking Diwala? Doesn't look like it, but I think they should. Oh, okay, look <laughs> at that. Nice. Pitch. <laughs> yeah, so Sam, so as, in his first day as PrairieCast Sam with Dwala, does the business development pitch to Bloom.com. There you go, it's out there. I would expect there. nothing less. That's, that's <laughs> how you, you uh, earn your keep. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if Nick is watching uh, or anybody else, but, but certainly make that happen. Smarty Pig is the next story. They had a big announcement, uh, I think just yesterday. Um, replacing President Bob Weinshank is new President Scott McCormick. Scott is a veteran of First National Bank, which is that big tower you see in Omaha, if you don't know. Uh, certainly one of the largest banks in the region. Um, and Scott also is coming directly from a prepaid card program in Omaha. So uh, this is really interesting. If you haven't kind of followed the Smarty Pig story, I, we were talking about this earlier today. And um, pre Dwala, pre Locusic, pre Tickly, those type, types of companies developing, when I looked at Des Moines and startups, Smarty Pig was the startup that I was aware of living from afar. Um, Bob had been there since September 2009. Uh, he was a veteran of Red McCombs companies, and Red McCombs, uh, the guy used to own the Vikings. I think he might have made his money in Clear Channel, if that sounds right. Um, the, the School of Business at the University of Texas is named for Mr. McCombs. So, big money player. Uh, he's the biggest investor in Smarty Pig. So, when he invested, I think they appointed Bob as CEO. Mm -hmm. Now, Bob has left. We don't really have much of a story beyond what um, the press release said, but, but it's interesting to see this change. And, and one thing that's very different from Bob, who lived in Austin, Texas, and commuted to Des Moines weekly, um, is that Scott lives in Omaha. So, still outside the region, but, but much, much closer. What do you guys think? Do you, you know the Smarty Pig story? You've been kind of in the scene since they... I've, um, it's an interesting move. I mean, I, I'm guessing it's the, the prepaid background that they're looking for because that's kind of where they're going to try to make their money, I think. Um, but uh, it's kind of interesting that Bob's out and there wasn't really any talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that actually is uh, interesting as well. It was a... His LinkedIn profile says that he started as president of Smarty Pig in November. The press release came out yesterday. So this is not a recent change. And I don't, like, I, I really don't know, like, what happened to Bob or if this was mutual. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, the investment structure didn't change, and, and McCombs is still invested. Mm -hmm. But 
right? And this goes back to our question. Uh, the question I have that we talked about maybe earlier today is um, the CEO as a commuter. <coughs> so having the CEO from Austin, uh, the former CEO, living in Austin, commuting up here to work, and now having the current CEO living in Omaha but commuting over. I know that's not a terrible commute, but I mean, I commute 45 minutes every day from Pella to Douala, and there's still some gap in uh, learning, in being here and being a part of the community, um, of where you are building your company. And so that's my question is, how do they do it? How do they uh, plan to have a striving um, business that's connected to the community here in Des Moines, which then launches itself nationally? That's my big question. Maybe they don't have to, um, but I mean, what do you guys think? It, I think it's a good question. I'm, I'm a, oh, go ahead, Michael, sorry. Uh, I was going to say that's an interesting question and one that I hadn't really thought of, but we've got other instances of companies uh, regionally that either have brought in a CEO from outside the region and then shifted their headquarters on account of that. We've got others that kind of maintain token presences in the region solely on account of a CEO located here. So it's interesting to see that and curious, you know, what, what changes, if any, that might lead to at Smarty Pig. But, you know, based on the fact that during Bob's tenure, they, they maintained the, their headquarters in Des Moines. You have to figure that, that Omaha wouldn't be an issue. So, Sure. Yeah, and, and I remember Danny interviewed Bob, I think, at South by Southwest. Bob was on a panel with the guys from Mint and, you know, some of these mm -hmm. other large. Mm -hmm. like, it was a great panel, and, and Danny got um, uh, an exclusive talk with Bob right after that. And, and he asked that question of, will Smarty Pig move to Austin? Like, the money's here, the CEO's here. Why would Smarty Pig stay in Des Moines? And he said, we will always maintain... The operations of the company in Des Moines, like it is our home and it's our people and that type of thing. Um, so I don't necessarily see that changing, but but it's a good point. And, and one of the companies I think that Michael's referring to is Sojourn in Omaha, who does the advertising on boarding passes. Mm -hmm. um, an Omaha mm -hmm. company, they hired a Silicon Valley, like San Francisco CEO, Mark Rabe. Is that right? Uh, Rabe, yeah. Rabe. Um, and, and kind of said nothing was going to change necessarily, but then we picked up that they changed their headquarters location on Crunchbase, which is TechCrunch's big index of startups and who works where. And, um, so we asked them for comments on that, and they said, oh, it was just a logistical thing. We're not really changing anything else. But, but it still was a change, right? Mm -hmm. And if you go to last time, I went and checked Sojourn's webpage at the time, and they still had Omaha listed as their headquarters, and I don't think they have offices listed in San Francisco on their website. But it still it signals something, and I'm not sure what it signals. I don't know that it does with Smarty Pig necessarily, but but that yeah. greater question is is really interesting. I mean, and I love Smarty Pig. I think it's a genius way to save money for what you want. I mean, I, I love it. But at the same time, it, you know, we, you're bringing somebody in, and let's talk about maybe about who they're br bringing in. I think looking at his credentials, especially, kind of shows. Yeah, they might be going into these prepaid solutions, uh, the car, the rewards card that they have right now. Um, I mean, so what is that going to look like? Do you guys have any ideas or thoughts? Yeah, so Danny, and well, Danny I, just said in this chat room here too, like mm -hmm. it, the experience is why he thinks that he's there. But go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I, I think the prepaid card industry vet is, is really what you know stands out as far as his background. And, and we did reach out to Smarty Pig yesterday after the release of uh, the press release to get a little more background. And they, they assured us that they would share that eventually, but at this time they're not interested in talking a whole lot. So we will uh, you know, keep, keep the audience posted on that story, but at this time we don't have a whole lot of insight into kind of the direction or, or any of the, uh, the nuts and bolts of the leadership change. Mm -hmm. And they, as a company, you know, Smarty Pig started out, I think, like my first Smarty Pig accounts were, you know, it really was drawn in not just by the Des Moines location, but the interest rate. Mm -hmm. And the interest rate has gone down significantly over time, as interest rates have everywhere. But Smarty Pig was always ahead of, you know. But I don't know that it's a real distinguishing factor anymore. But the other way that you get the benefit of using Smarty Pig is to put your money on a prepaid card, and then you get an upgrade, six percent increase or whatever when you do that. And so maybe they've just realized that the interest rate game is something they're not necessarily going to win, and mm -hmm. they got to specialize on the card side, and that's where they can provide value to their members. And yeah. this. Scott is the guy to do that. That would be my guess. But. Well, that's probably where any revenue is coming from, too, now that they're not making money off holding money as much as they were when interest rates were high, because they probably Absolutely. had the same effect when they're holding that money. They, they can make money off of that money. Well, with that rate down, then they have to figure out different revenue streams, and that's where prepaid cars came in. Yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. I was just going to say that I think that um, – there's a lot of pieces of this whole, like, where are they going, what are they doing, what are they thinking? But at the end of the day, it's kind of a thing for me where they've done so well having their CEO in Austin 
that this move to have somebody in Omaha is probably going to go just as well as it previously has. So yeah. while I would love to see them, obviously, it's like rah, rah, Des Moines. I'd love to see them just bring it all in-house and everybody's heads down all the time, face-to-face, right? I think that they can pull it off. I don't think most people could, but for whatever reason, their structure, they can really rock it. So their culture is set as such. Yeah. That they can handle that, and they have handled that. They've shown they can handle that. Yeah, so it's, it's, they're going to be successful, I'm sure. I mean, yeah. they're just going to continue doing really well. Yeah. They're and smart people over there. And I, I definitely agree with that. To Also, to Sam's point, um, unlike maybe the experience that you guys have had with Dwalla, where Ben is very active in the community, and you see him as CEO at lots of events, yeah. and like... Like Smarty Pig CEOs have never done that. Sure. Smarty, that I know of, the Smarty Pig, most of the Smarty Pig staff, like I, they're not as easily identified. Maybe it's T-shirts, although they do have great T-shirts. But <laughs> like it's it's a uh, um, like you just don't see Smarty Pig employees out and about mm-hmm. and kind of at mm-hmm. things like you do Dwell employees or you might th- those types of things. So maybe being a visible member of the community is not as important to them. Whereas I think it's it's led to some of the successes that Dwell has had thus far, and then I'd like to see other particularly staff ninja that like those types of companies like have here like maybe that's just not part of smarty pigs culture sure even though i'd love to see it that way sure um, so the question would be from a because uh, they're past startup phase and they're really into yeah. infiltration stage they're in al roker talks about us on the today show phase <laughs> there you go there you times. go <laughs> <laughs> fantastic so well that's the question is can they lead through that um and really become a a you know family or household name where everybody mm-hmm. knows about smarty pig um, and it's just an interesting path because different cultures do different things. And is there longevity in an, in one over the other? I don't know. And we'll kind of see how it plays out. Yeah. What, one thing I don't want to lose, and this is probably something for Michael to take note of that came in the chat room, was um, I think Mark Hollander said that, that he thought Bob's focus was on international growth for Smarty Pig. So that's something to ask. Maybe they've changed that because Smarty Pig launched in Australia mm-hmm. early on with a different banking partner with ANZ um, there. And then they moved their deposits from West Bank in Des Moines to BBVA, which is a Spanish bank. And I remember hearing at the time, like that was about now that they're with an international bank, they can go into new um, uh, countries easily. So they can expand internationally yeah. without having to get different banking partners to yeah. license there yeah. since they have an international bank. Um, but I haven't heard anything about that. Maybe I've missed it. Like I, I think it's still Australia and the U.S. are the only two places you can use Smarty Pig. Yeah. So I wonder if this is a signal that that strategy has changed. So I'll put that on your to-do list, Michael, for or Danny, yeah. whoever. And, and one quick note: uh, my computer is such that uh, I, I do not have the chat room open. Otherwise, I'd be getting some bad feedback. So if anyone is directing anything at me, I apologize. I'm not just disregarding comments, but uh, at the moment, don't have it open. So. Okay. Um, no, that 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 is uh, good to know. But yeah, so let's uh, definitely keep track of that and uh, and see where that where that story goes. So Smarty Pig stuff really really interesting. Like I said, they're kind of the past startup stage, but the grandfather of active startups in Des Moines. Right. Like I think about right. those guys first and for what they've done here and, and where it's going. So always excited to see where that goes. All right, one more story on the show today. Um, Big Omaha, this is a little more national in scope. Big Omaha 2011 alum, former TechCrunch writer, editor, I'm not sure what title of their was there, but Sarah Lacey uh, launched a new publication, I believe just yesterday, called the Pando Daily. Um, the name comes from some type of type of tree in Utah, and you can read the background of the name, which is kind of interesting. But um, the goal, to me, as she says, the goal for Pando Daily is to be uh, the site of record for the startup root system and everything that springs up from it cycle after cycle. So she wants to be the publication where you go to find out, I guess, the, the, the scoop on stories, really the tech crunch. For the Silicon Valley. I think she's saying for the world. I but, hope but so. But rooted very much in Silicon Valley because mm-hmm. that is where that, that's the whole kind of Pando tree root yeah. system thing um, would be like that root system of Silicon Valley and it stretches out to other places. I think Which that's I, the, the larger metaphor yeah. of the name of the company. But, I certainly um, hope so. I just think it's funny that at the top it says Pando Daily, the side of record for Silicon Valley. Does it really? Yeah. Maybe just for Silicon Valley. But I saw they're already doing stories on, <laughs> yeah, on New yeah, York yeah. companies and things like that. So maybe it is Silicon Valley. But uh, it looks to me like it's kind of get the band back together from TechCrunch more than mm-hmm. than that, but under her auspices rather than Arrington's. Well, because they can't probably do it under Arrington's name because of all the legal trouble that he's got in. Yeah, it's... As his departure. Well, I'll, maybe I'll just start here. Like, are you guys going to... Like, I still read TechCrunch and keep an eye on the stories going there. Are you going to read Pando Daily instead at this point? If they pop up on Tech Meme. <laughs> <laughs> is that where you go? Is that the, I mean, the, that's... 
that's kind of where I get my curation. Um, so, and she did yesterday. It was like the number one story on there. Yeah. Now, that's the question. You said that word curation, right? We're always looking for the best sites that offer not only opinion, strong opinion, strong opinions, but also facts, news um, that isn't content. yeah original content that isn't just repeated, um, and the curation of that content. I mean, their voice is going to be strong, and they're really going to make it if their voice is strong. Um, we're going to start reading them if their voice is strong. That just like we started reading Tech TechCrunch at the beginning because they had a strong voice, mm -hmm. and maybe. We don't read TechCrunch anymore because their voice has been waning over the past six months to a year. And, and that's the question is, will they come strong and actually do great reporting? Yeah, and then I want to hold on to that. Michael, I'm going to come back to you for your thoughts in a second. But what makes for a strong voice? We've had this question internally in our newsroom as we kind of look at our voice versus looking for news. But, but talk about that. Like. Right. Uh, to me, I may, this is my opinion. I think to me it's it's reporting the news, and but it's also having that – um, probably a personal touch to it. I mean, why do you love some of the greatest reporters ever? It's because they always have a personal touch to the story. And can she, with this Pando Daily, add that personal note where there is an opinion or there is something that is more than just the straight news? Because we can go to, you know, a Twitter feed to find just the news of the day and mm -hmm. what's going on. You get the press um, release. Exactly. Yeah. We can get the press release. But in, even as we see, you know, Douala grow and people writing stories about us. It's the stories that actually put it into their own words that are the best, uh, not just repeating the the content that maybe we give them. And I think that's the point, and, and that's what I want to see Pando Daily do, is bring that voice that is authentic. Great. Michael, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, you are a degree journalist. You've worked in a Gannett newsroom, and, and then, of course, have grown so much in your time with Silicon Prairie News. But I want to hear your thoughts on, <laughs> on this. Uh, one thing that stands out to me is the sort of insistence, uh, much like TechCrunch, on being the first to deliver a story, and if, if they're not, then they'll kind of grudgingly report on it if it's newsworthy, but this, this idea of getting those exclusives. Uh, and at this point, I think a big part of the reason people look to a TechCrunch is because it's the one with those exclusives. And when you look at companies, you know, if obviously we prefer that you come to Silicon Valley News first, but if you're looking for a national outlet that's going to draw a lot of eyes, you'll go to TechCrunch with that exclusive and you'll get that. Mm -hmm. Well, at this point, Pando Daily, I don't think, has that name recognition that companies will come to them. So it'll be interesting to see if, you know, in addition to establishing a voice and all that, if uh, Pando Daily can establish itself as kind of that preferred outlet, because until then, I, I still look to TechCrunch as the favorite. And Pando Daily is just kind of you know a, a second or third player, and and um, the kind of begrudgingly cover it piece I think is this ticker that they have on the side called the Pando ticker, and Danny says that he really likes the idea. I describe it, it's almost like an, a live Prairie Moves, like what we do with Prairie Moves, where we link out to coverage that startups in our community have that isn't from us necessarily, but. The, it, it's a paragraph on like there's a Wall Street Journal interview that they Andy has pulled up here. So it's a paragraph on that. I think a sentence of content from. Pando Daily, and then it links you out to the Wall Street Journal to see it. So they'll put you in that if you're current news. They'll only put you in the main blog and write about you if you give them something exclusive. And that, at least that's the way that I that I read her description of what they want to do. And yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if that's really true. If she'll yeah, hold I mean, there to are only that without so having so many exclusives to go around, I guess. Yeah, and would you would you choose TechCrunch or Pando Daily at this point for your exclusive and? Um, yeah, and I don't know. And it would be interesting to have asked this question of Jordan, too, because cause he plays that role with your company uh -huh. of kind of mm -hmm. getting information to the right one. Um, what would you do with Tickley's breaking news? Oh, I'd send it to Silicon Prairie News. That's, uh. the, that's the right <laughs> answer. <laughs> great answer, great answer. Um, I think it's really, really cool. I like the concept. Um, I really hope that they change the side of record for Silicon Valley to the side of record for... This, I don't know, startups of America, I don't know, whatever it ends up being. That just kind of gives me a knee-jerk reaction where I'm like, oh, so Silicon Prairie, what do we do? Okay, great. Um, but I think it's really cool, and what I would love to see is I would eat this up if it was on my iPad, right? Yeah. So I would use this as my um, mobile, this is where I get all of my news um, regarding tech, and I really love Sarah. I think she's awesome. And so... I'm, of course, going to support it, but if I had to choose between Pando Daily and TechCrunch and had equal opportunity to get featured in them, I'd choose TechCrunch for being smart, you know, yeah. and I would hesitate and almost send it to Pando Daily because then I'd be like one of, you know, 
20 things that have been posted or whatever it is. So right. we'll see. I mean, I feel like it's going to be successful, but is there, a, is there room you, for both? Maybe. Yeah, well, maybe the question, that's a great <clears throat> question. Is there room for both? And, the, and maybe uh, another question would be, is she forgetting where TechCrunch came from? Because mm-hmm. TechCrunch grew organically to become what they are. Mm-hmm. And to think that Pando Daily can launch and be a competitor with TechCrunch right away just because the same writers are there, is that naive? I, I mean, I don't know. It, it might be, but I think she is of the opinion based on what I've read that, that TechCrunch today isn't what TechCrunch was three months ago. before. Like, like but it has the eyes. Does it? I mean, I think it does, but I mean, I don't know what the traffic comparison is, and I think that's what she's kind of saying. Like, she yeah. she talks about like when Michael left, when Arrington left, that she could either come back and put the pieces together at TechCrunch, and there's been rumors that she was offered the editor in chief job there, and she turned it down to start this. Okay. Like, she could either run that or do her own thing and chose to yeah. do her own thing. But um, you're right though. But I'm, same writers, so it's it's it it's interesting. So she says like. They're going to be ruthless. They're going to, they're competitive. They want to be tops. But she also says they want to bring uh, more civility into the blogosphere. And I don't know how those two things like jive necessarily because she has Michael Arrington yeah, that's and she has Paul Carr. Like Paul Carr is dropping F bombs left and right in comments right now on the site. Like, how does that bring more civility back if you bring back these guys who are controversial? And that's where I was kind of going with voice yeah. is voice controversy. Because, like, I like. For like news of the day, not tech news. Like I like the way Brian Williams presents things. Like I think Brian Williams from NBC has a good sure. voice, but yeah. I also don't feel like he's a snarky jerk. And I re- feel that way a lot <laughs> when I read Michael Arrington stuff. <laughs> Even though there's some credibility to that, like I would be afraid of what he would say if he was writing about Prairiecast right now. Like just because mm-hmm. I don't think it's constructive, it's more tearing down. And so, you don't trust. Yeah, you don't trust him in that sense. Yeah. Right. And I think there's a fine line between snark and then just an authoritative stance on things. I mean, you can investigate the credibility of something without just tearing it down and dropping F-bombs and making everyone feel terrible. So there's a, there's definitely a distinction there between maybe what TechCrunch became known for and what you can do to still have an authoritative voice. Absolutely. But, yeah, but, but Sarah's stuff, I've thought, I've seen more value in than Arrington and Carr as far as that. Oh, but, yeah. But, you know, it very much feels like when you go look at the... The, the post titles like it feels like I'm reading TechCrunch like the way things are structured mm-hmm. on the site and but that's obviously their history but. Um, would you invest two and a half million dollars into a blog because that's what she raised <laughs> she raised two and a half million she raised <laughs> ten individual investors mm-hmm. with big big names mm-hmm. seven seed funds including Crunch Fund which of course was the exit for Arrington Crunch Fund isn't you know if you follow the dotted line like TechCrunch is owned by money. AOL. AOL puts money into Crunch Fund. Crunch Fund gets Arrington fired from TechCrunch. Well, and, and now Tech Crunch Fund invests in, like, yeah, not, it's not big. only does AOL invest in the Crunch Fund, the money that Arrington made through the acquisition is also funding Crunch Fund. Right. And now <laughs> it's that, an incestuous pool. It is. That's what it, it is. is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I didn't realize $2.5 million. So $2.5 million to launch this blog. She spent $8,000 on her WordPress yeah. site. Um, she, she if anybody wants that. to do that, call me. Andy would like to build eight thousand dollars WordPress sites for people, <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, I, it, it's really interesting. I mean, it, it, this will be like a fun like case study to watch, like how this develops, because it's kind of like, uh, even though it's somewhat competitive, like we would rather have the Tickly and Dwell stories come to us and people read them there first and have those featured on Tech Meme. Like, um, like they overlap with us, but they're also kind of their own beast out on the West Coast that that doesn't. So, also, right. no ads. No. There's no that? well. There's no ads on the site currently. Okay. So are they going to get back in the event game, event space, to actually create revenue? Or th- that was interesting that they got all this money and there's no obvious revenue. Where, where is the re- yeah? Them. If yeah, and that so that's the other part. Right? She says like blatantly like I do not want to sell this company. If I wind up selling this company, I failed. But she took two and a half million dollars from seventeen different investors. Why do you invest in a company if you're not going to get an exit, right? I mean, and then she had a paragraph that said, "But if the numbers right, right. I'll take yeah. it." Yeah. <laughs> so it was just kind of funny. So yeah, the the line that stood out to me is success is keeping our independence forever. But then all of a sudden, you've got two and a half mil from all these high powered investors, and you know that may be easy to say on day one, but down the road, I think the external pressures will will have a different. Uh, you know, may may lead things in a different direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I have no idea where this is headed. I honestly it's, can say, it's. I, I think it's it's super interesting from a business mm-hmm. perspective to just watch how this works, and it's obviously kind of in our sector, so right. it's 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 something we'll keep an right. eye on. But and maybe a, a closing comment on this sure. would be, 
um, they have the platform. That's something we can't argue. The writers have the platform to really spread this news really quickly. Uh, and then the question is, can they produce content that rivals and, and does better than TechCrunch? I mean, is that kind of what we're saying is they got the platform. Now, what are they going to do with it? Going to do something great with it? Or are they just going to do a, a, a TechCrunch 2.0, as I think Danny said in the chat room? Yeah. And, and is that okay? And we don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's day two for Pando Daily. Yep. So there you go. It prompts a lot of questions, but uh, not quite a lot of answers yet, but we'll see where it goes. Any other thoughts? Closing, all right. Uh, well, we're actually at the end of our time, so let's go ahead and wrap it up. That's it for today's show. I want to thank everybody for joining us online. Spirited uh, group in the chat room, as always, today. Really appreciate that. Thanks also to Delta Dental of Iowa for your sponsorship. Um, Emma, where should people go to learn more about you? You can follow me on Twitter at Emza or my company, Tickly, at Tickly Co. And Sam? Yeah, follow me on Twitter at, at Drager, and then uh, my website is Drager.net. Michael, how about you? You can find me on Twitter at J Michael Stacy J's and James, or uh, obviously SiliconPrairieNews.com. And Andy, you met Andy.com. That takes longer. We have this big group. I know. Uh, it does. All good. Find my blog at gwood.me. Prairiecast is produced by John Thompson of Evolve. Find out more about his services at dmevolve.com. For more on the show, check us out on Facebook at facebookcom prairiecast. And for more on all the things we talked about today, see SiliconPrairieNews.com. And we will see you right back here next week. Thanks, everyone.